Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this presentation. I'm Elena. I work in Booking.com. And uh, there, every day, I have to build a model that will run in production. By that, I mean that they will really run on our website and uh, determine what to show to the user. So in this presentation, I would like to share some of my learnings when I was working on that kind of projects. And I hope uh, that then you wouldn't have to face this, uh, do the same mistakes that I made in my work. So as a first question, I would like to ask, how many of you actually made a model, a machine learning model that was running in production? By that, I mean in a website or in some kind of software. Hmm, that's quite a lot of people. That's great. And how many people would like to build that kind of model to run it in production? Oh. So I hope then this presentation would be useful for quite a lot of people. So in Booking.com, we have enormous amount of data about users, something that can be a problem for one company where you have only a few thousand users is not a problem for us. We have enormous amount of information, enormous amount of data. We have computational power to run uh, machine learning models on that amount of data. And we have a system that allows us to productionize these models within a few minutes. So it sounds like we have solved all the problems. What else can actually go wrong when you want to build your model in production? Actually, the answer is almost everything can go wrong. And uh, let's start with the first problem. The problem is where you want to apply your machine learning model to improve the user experience. If you look at booking.com, our website is quite different from the websites such as Amazon or Facebook, where users go there weekly or daily or five times per day, depending on how addicted you are to Facebook. Our users usually make booking maybe once or twice per year, and that can be very different types of bookings. So some people go once per, for ski vacations and the other some summer trip, or some users only go for a trip where they need a, some business trip. That makes it very hard to predict what will be the next one and how can, based on the previous data, we can help the user to make a new booking. Another challenge is that most of the users are not logged in. So we actually, even if the user made a booking, you actually don't know about that b before it, we, he logs in. So as a result, we have a continuous cold start problem. Then you might think, OK, we don't know anything about users. How can we even make any machine learning models without this information? And it turned out there is, that there are enormous amount of areas where you can do machine learning modeling to help the user, even if you don't know a lot about the user. One of the examples is content summarization. If you come to our website, there is enormous amount of information that can be very overwhelming for you that we can summarize to the user so that you would not have to go through all this and just have a small piece of it. As an example, it, you can look at the review data that we have. So if you want to book a very good hotel, you usually go to the review page, you have a thousand of reviews, and most obviously you don't want to spend three hours of reading all of them. So we can run a topic detection model that actually identifies what kind of topics users were talking about in their reviews, and we can summarize them in such a small table that you can see on the hotel page. 111 users were saying that stuff was great. 86 users were saying that location was wonderful. So you see machine learning, even we don't know information about the user, but we can help. Another area of machine learning that can be very useful for other people. So when users browse through the website, and maybe you are one of these users, you usually see, OK, I have so many different options, different price, different uh, facilities, different locations. How would I find the best hotel when I get best facilities for the money that I pay? And we have a model that does it for you. So a model that determines whether the value for money is actually good or not. So that kind of models we called content evaluation. So instead of you evaluating all this content, with ma the help of machine learning, we do it for you. And then we just add a small icon that says great value for money. Another option is to segment users. So we have all types of users that have very different behavior. Although when user joins the website, he doesn't necessarily tell us, OK, I'm that kind of user. Please provide me this information. So one of the examples can be users that are 
flexible in dates. So we can have users who already bought their tickets to a particular destination, and they need to come on this Saturday. And users who haven't bought them yet, so they can come two weeks later, two weeks earlier, and then they are way more flexible. And then we can provide them different suggestions on the best dates for best prices. But if the user is not flexible, this kind of information will be very disturbing for the users. So it, we better avoid it. And uh, although users might not tell us specifically whether he is flexible on dates or not, we have our training data where we know which users, what kind of users actually change their date eventually in their search. And we can train this classifier for that kind of user segmentation. So now you have seen that there are a lot of models that you can use to improve user experience, even if you don't have a lot of history of user interactions. But when the user joins our website, and as soon as he, he or she starts to click on specific items, we kind of get, gather this kind of information that can be relevant for us. And uh, with these interactions, our users become so-called warmer. So we can actually start doing personalization based on your specific behavior. OK, now we saw that there are a lot of models that we can build. But uh, how to build these models? Is it actually that easy and there are no problems at all? Yeah, of course no. You can guess it from the title of the talk. Uh, so the first problem is the data. Although we can have millions of different uh, uh, data sets, it might not be always the data set that you want to have. Let me give you a simple example. Let's imagine you want to predict a very simple thing whether uh, you as a user would like to have a breakfast or you want, don't want to have a breakfast. OK, this is just a linear binary classifier. And uh, if you look at the data, what would you assume? You can divide our users into three categories. Those who need this breakfast, those who don't need, and maybe a small part that doesn't care. However, actually, we don't know what is the intent of the user? Because there is no place on the website where we ask about that. The only thing that we have is users who made a booking. And from that users, we see who actually bought something with a breakfast and those who didn't buy a breakfast. As a result, this is what we observe. And this is what we actually want to know. There is some small overlap, but this is very tricky to say that Exactly everyone who is here have the same behavior as those users that we observe. And the, giving this limited amount of information, you, of course, you can make different assumptions. You, can, you might say that, OK, users who made a booking and users who didn't make a booking are exactly the same. And then you made a model based on those users who booked and extrapolate your results to all users. But there is a problem, because indeed you make this assumption, you basically estimate the conditional probability of your action, in our case it's the users who will make, book a breakfast, giving that users will book. And that can be very different users. It can be users that will book anyway. So actually our model would not help them because they maybe it's a business trip, they would book whatever you show to them. But we w actually want to help the users who are confused with the information. So there are a lot of ways how you can deal with that kind of problems where you have some portion of the data where you have labels and another part of the data that actually doesn't have labels. So it is, you can look at different papers about positive unlabeled learning, and it will also depend on what kind of type of data you think you have and what kind of labels you have. OK, sometimes you can work with that kind of data where you only assume that you know the labels based on some kind of condition. You can also look at the problem from the other side and say, OK, I want to identify user's intent from some other interaction. That kind of interaction can be, for example, filters that users clicked. So if you clicked the filter that you want to have a breakfast, this is exactly your intent. And then we don't need to limit ourselves to only those users who made a booking. That can be a solution. That's great. Now we answered our question. But not exactly. Because if you click the filters that you want to have a spa, this is your picture in your head. But what you end up booking might be something like this. And you're also perfectly fine with that. So the fact that you filtered on something doesn't actually explain us how important is this feature to you. Is it crucial for you to have a breakfast? But, or is it something you can have it? Or if you don't have it, you're fine. 
Then maybe you want to look at what happens after that, whether user actually unclicked this filter, how did user behave later on. This is a tricky part as well. Another challenge with the data. So user is not static. When user come to our website, you can start with explore phase. You say, OK, I want to come to PyData event in Amsterdam. I want to make a reservation for two guests for one night in Amsterdam. You start searching. Oh my god, a night in Amsterdam, 200 euros. OK. And by the way, I have a child with me, and I actually want to stay for a Sunday as well. So it's two nights, and I have a child. You refine your search. You understand that it's super expensive. There is no, nothing good for you. You'll say, OK, I will stay in Harlem, probably. You define your search. You made a booking. What do you have at the end? You have a lot of uh, information about the same users where you have different values for the same feature. So if your feature is a number of uh, guests, here you have two guests, here you have three guests, user change the destination, user change the number of nights. And the longer the search of the user, the more information you will have. If you just train your model on this raw data, you might have a very strong impact of the users who made a very long search that have, I don't know, 50 different searches and ended up booking, and those users who had like only two searches and booked after that. So that's very important how you compress this information so we would have fair estimation of what was the impact of particular feature. And that, will, that is not obvious at all. How do I summarize these features? Should I take only the ones that were at the beginning, so when the user entered the website, or should I take the mean, median mode? I think the main answer for that will be it depends on what you want to get at the end. If you want to run your model once when the user made uh, his first entrance to the website and you don't want to change anything after that, that makes sense to take only these features. If you want to change the value of, the mo of your prediction on every step that user makes and then change on the website accordingly, then you actually want to be correct most of the time. Then you might look at the mode of your features. Or maybe you want to just make a final prediction correctly, and then you only when you're at that stage, you want to cha add a change to the website and show them something different. So let's say that we have perfect data. Everything works now. The second challenge is the modeling. Even, to the sim even if you have the simplest thing to do, for example, you want to rank the hotels on our website based on user preference. You want to show to the user the most probable hotel that user would like or book. It is not so simple to do. Let's imagine you want to just to make a binary classifier which will say whether user will book this hotel or not. You can imagine that when you try to train your model on the observational data, there is at least one very tricky part. The probability that user will click or book the hotel that we showed on the first position is not exactly the same as the hotel on the position number 235, because not all the users will scroll down. And that creates a problem that we have a very strong position bias, which is not so trivial to estimate from your training data. There, are there is a lot of discussion in the literature, how can you estimate this position bias so that you can actually train your the model, not the fact that, OK, what was on the first position, this is what the user will book. And uh, one of the simplest ways how to deal with it is to make data random, uh, randomization. So you show all the hotels in random order. So uh, relevant hotels and irrelevant hotels can occur on the first position. And from that, you can estimate this position bias, and you can put it in your model, and then you model the real intent of the user, not the intent of the user plus the position bias. Of course, there can be a challenge with this approach. How do you think what can go wrong if you show random hotels on the first position? <laughs> yeah, and that kind of hotel can actually be something super irrelevant to the user. You can, if maybe you are a user who is looking for a luxury hotel and you show him a hostel, users can get pissed off and just churn and never come back to our website. So there is a very nice paper by, uh, I think, Google from this year. You can check this link where they're discussing how to make this randomization with lowest costs 
or even if you don't have a randomization, how to try to approximate this position bias. Another problem. Although we might think we know what we want to do, we can mix the definition of user intent and the outcome. Let me explain you on the example. So let's return to our uh, task where we want to predict whether user want to uh, book a property with a breakfast or not. So on our website, you can see both options uh, for some hotels. So some hotel can propose you can pay, you don't have a breakfast, but if you want, you can pay 10 euros extra for that. And here the breakfast is included. And again, we want to predict those users who will book something with a breakfast. So what I did, I, it's a binary classifier. What can be easier? I have all my data. I trained it. And then I decided to look what kind of coefficients do I have? What turned out is that the main coefficient that determines my outcome was the city where user goes to, which actually doesn't make that much sense. Well, maybe some you can find a hypothesis that can explain it, but I thought that sounds a bit tricky. And then I looked at my data. What I saw is that in some cities, for example, in St. Petersburg, we have 2,000 hotels, and 75% of them don't have any breakfast because it's mainly people who rent their apartments, so they just don't provide it. And in cities, for example, like Palma de Mallorca, 66% of the properties include the breakfast by default. There is no option to not have a breakfast. So just saying that for all the users in St. Petersburg say they wouldn't have a breakfast and for all users in Palma de Mallorca say that they will, I already have a pretty good classifier that predicts everything correctly in 70% of cases. But do I actually predict what user wanted to book or do I predict what user had to book because for the first 1,500 properties that I, we showed to the user in St. Petersburg, there was no breakfast and no one ever looked at, at our page number 300 to find it. I think we are not actually predicting their intent that well in that case. So in that case, when you have that kind of problems where the intent and the outcome don't match, it's very important to double check all your coefficients, analyze your model, and also test it in an experiment to see whether what you predict actually match to what users do in reality when we introduce our intervention. And here we come to happened to the very important part of all this modeling process is to do experimentation. So no matter how good your model was when you're testing it offline on your training and test data, you had the best performance in the world, it actually might not be that good in reality. That's why in booking.com we have about maybe more than thousand experiments running simultaneously on our website where we divide our users to base and variant, and we measure whether there is a, a significant difference in the effect. And by doing that, we can definitely say whether there is some impact on the real user or our model was performing very well only on test data and reality is very different. So as you can see, there are a lot of challenges when you model, when you do the modeling and you want to apply it in production. And there are no golden rules that will solve all your challenges. That's why it's very important to try to learn in smaller steps, test everything in experimentation, find these hidden biases, adjust them and run another experiment to, set, to test whether you are now accounting for everything. So that was the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we are looking for data scientists and specifically in my team, we're looking for data scientists with background uh, in NLP. So if you have some relevant knowledge, please approach me and I will be happy to explain you more. Thank you very much. Well, it depends uh, on whether there is a c some kind of user cookie and what kind of devices user use. So that will definitely depend, not in all cases. 
and indeed that can be tricky again. And when users change the platform, so you're working on your computer and then you came and started booking something from your mobile, it's also something that you can ad identify. Sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, given that we run so many experiments simultaneously, uh, can it actually hurt us in identifying whether there is an effect or not? Indeed. So there can be a problem with that. That's why we try to monitor these things. So we try to understand whether there can be some potential interactions between them. And if there is, then we don't run these experiments simultaneously. But our website is huge. And uh, we're not running on experiments only on the website, but on many different things. So we try to isolate things that we want to test. And if there is something similar that we want to test, then people wait and the team will wait till the previous experiments will be over. So the question is, uh, you know, although we don't know a lot of information about user bookings, uh, there are an another features that you can use in your modeling, like the time spent on a website, the, the time when the user logs in, and, uh, and can we use it in our models? Indeed. So when, for example, you can think about user location or a place where user wants to go, or how, how many days user wants to go. So it all uh, uh, describes user preferences, although we don't need to know who is this user and and anything about the the previous bookings. So these features by itself are al already very strong features that give us a lot of information on what can be the best property for the user or best uh, useful information. And we do that indeed. Any more questions? Hi. Um, how do you train models for timely events? Like for instance, there was a concert in some town that you never heard of. And how do you make sure you have a model that actually is pretty Uh, the question is, uh, how do we take into account events about which we don't know? Yeah. So, for example, if there was a concert uh, in a particular area. So the question is whether we actually... It's important for us to know about these events. So, not always, there, uh, but we do take into account some historical trends in the data. So, for example, there might not be a specific. Uh, there might be some concerts that are randomly allocated, but there can be some concerts that are always on the 9th of June. Yeah, uh, I don't know in Amsterdam. So then, by taking historical data into account, next year we can predict that there will be low availability uh, in this area. Okay. Any more questions? All right, in that case, I would like to uh, have one uh, last round of applause for Elena.